when you think about growing up as a child, um, what, who was it, not what, but who was it that you looked up to? Who was it that you kind of admired? Who was the, the person, it might have been somebody you knew personally that was part of your family, maybe an older brother, uh, a mom or a dad or a cousin or maybe a friend. Uh, maybe it was, a, it was a friend's older brother or uh, older sister. Uh, but who was it that you wanted to grow up and be like? Who was it that you wanted to, to, to model your life after? When I think about my life growing up, uh, there's a few people that come to mind. First is um, somebody lost. We got a Dr. Pepper coming down, all, all the way down. Um, well done, Dwayne. Congratulations. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> I want to be like Dwayne when I grow up. He's just like, hey, that's mine. I got it. It's, it's all me. Um, but who did you want to be? Uh, for, for me, I, a few people came to mind this week as I was thinking about this. One is Maverick, Top Gun. I mean, when I was a kid, Top Gun was, it was, it was a show that I liked to watch, me and my friends. I remember getting on the swing sets back in the day. I don't even know that they make swing sets like this anymore, but there was like this seesaw that would swing, and it would kind of go back and forth, and you could sit, one person could sit on one side, and, one could sit, and we would act like that was a fighter jet, and it's like, whew, you know, you're just like, you're, you know, doing all the things that Tom Cruise, does, Tom Cruise does in Top Gun. So I was really stoked when the new Top Gun came out, and it did live up to the expectations. So Maverick was one that, man, every time I watched that movie, I just pictured myself, I'm going to be a fighter pilot one day. And then I remembered, no, Wes, you're afraid of heights. You don't even like to fly. So that was out of the, that was out of the, uh, the, 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 the idea of possibilities. And then there was Daniel Russo. Karate Kid, wax on, wax off. I mean, that, that was every single time. I mean, you would just be, if you're a boy, maybe some of you ladies did this too, I would just go stand in the mirror and just practice the pose, you know? And then I realized that I looked a lot more like Johnny Lawrence than I did Daniel Russo. And um, yes, I get that all the time. Um, there has been times where I've been in a large room on a stage like this and someone from the crowd yelled, Cobra Kai. And I was like, thanks, man. I appreciate for running my life. And uh Comparing me to that guy, it could be worse. Um, there, there, there were all kinds of people that we, we think about, but I remember very clearly the commercials, the Gatorade commercials, with a guy named Michael Jordan. It had a little jingle to it, a little song, like Mike, want to be like Mike. Those are, that was a song, and it was on TV all the time. Michael Jordan was at the prime of his basketball career, and he'd be down in some Gatorade after, you know, dominating everybody in some basketball, and like Mike, want to be like Mike, no, 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 like, and it would just go over and over and over. And so was, I would think to myself, okay, all I need to do is just drink some more Gatorade, and I'm going to be like Mike. And the problem was is that it didn't matter how much Gatorade I drank, I still was never like Mike. I did play basketball. I was on the high school basketball team. Um, I was so good that I had the best seat in the house from the sideline on the bench. I had the cleanest shoes. I had the driest uniform at the end of the game, uh, but I was on the team. Uh, my favorite part of our home basketball games was pregame warm-up because that was my time to shine. You know, going out and, you know, there's just something different about the pregame warm-up, the music's playing, the stands are full, and, you know, I'm running out there, and, you know, white boys can't jump, uh, but I thought I could jump, and I'd always, I always felt like I jumped a little bit higher when things were, you know, amped up like that in the room, and, you know, guys are dunking because the referees aren't out there, and, uh, but the reality is, is I, 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 there's nothing about me that can be like Mike Jordan when it comes to basketball. Um, but I, I want to ask a question. I just want to see what you think of me and just kind of make sure we're, we have clear expectations. How many of you right now think that Wes Jackson can dunk a basketball? On a regulation goal. All right, I got one believer. All right, <laughs> you, my friend, have won a free dinner for the lifetime of, just kidding. Um, nobody believes I can dunk a basketball. Are you serious right now? I'm a little bit offended. Um, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you that your 42-year-old pastor can dunk a basketball, so, um, we got a basketball, I'll go back here. Because um, you don't believe me, I'm going to show you how. Just kidding. Um, that's, that's not, that's not going to happen. Um, because I don't need you leaving here tonight. And people are like, hey, how was church tonight, a church story? Well, our pastor broke his back because he thought he could dunk a basketball. Um, because I can't dunk a basketball. I can't even palm a basketball. I used to, but oh, there it is. All right, all right, we, we got, we're on to something. Like Mike, want to be like Mike. Um, I can palm a basketball for about two seconds. Three, four, all right. Here's the reason I tell you that. I don't know if any of you can relate to that, but watching the Michael Jordan commercials and singing the song, like Mike, want to be like Mike, ultimately is impossible. Now, I didn't 
my life didn't fall apart because I couldn't play basketball like Michael Jordan. I wish that I could because he was incredibly successful. But the reason that I share that and just kind of get our minds there is because that's a little bit of where we're going tonight. Because I think as Christians, if you are a Jesus follower in the room tonight, then and you would call yourself a Christian, what that means is that you are a little Christ. That's what that word means. That you are specifically a little Christ. And if you're not a Christian, you're not a follower of Jesus, but you're here, listen, there is, there's no, uh, I'm, not, I'm not trying to make you feel uncomfortable. I'm super thankful that you're here. And I just want to invite you and let you know that this is a place you can do that. You can check things out. You can kick the tires on this whole Jesus thing. You can ask questions. You can be who you are. Um, and let us walk with you in that. And let's, let's look for answers together. Uh, but if you were here tonight, you would call yourself a Christ follower, a little Christ, then what that means is, is that you are trying to take on the identity of Jesus. You have trusted him, and as you've trusted him, you're trying to become more like him. But the frustration in that is that sometimes as we try to become more like Jesus, it feels impossible. It feels a little bit like trying to be Michael Jordan. And none of us obviously were as good as Michael Jordan when it comes to basketball. And we're in this series we started last week called Love Revolution. And the whole idea behind the series is that we would get to the end of this year. And as we land into November and December, we could look back on this year and we could say that this year I grew closer in my relationship to God than I have in a really, really long time. No matter where you are, that there was progress that could be made in your relationship. And we started last week talking about, um, we, I made this statement, I said that a growing relationship with God is intentional, not accidental. It's not just going to happen one day. You're not just going to um, ask that tomorrow I would be closer to God, but not do anything to try to cultivate that, to try, to try to stir up that relationship with him. So we started looking at the verse in Mark chapter 12, verse 30, which simply says this. It's a verse that even if you haven't been in church maybe ever, you maybe have heard this verse. It's, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, Actually, it's and with all your soul. I think it's important to recognize the and in here. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And so last week what we did is we focused in on what does it look like to love God with all of your heart. To love the Lord your God, which means that there's this, this intentional surrender to, to who God is has called me to be, to trust him fully because of what he did by sending his son Jesus. I trust him. I love him with all of my heart. And last week we talked about that. What that looks like is, is to just get to know him. Instead of focusing on loving him more, what would it look like just to get to know God more? Because I think as we get to know God more, then there's a natural response to love him more. It's a choice that you choose to make. It's not just this affectionate moment where you feel good because you love God. It's 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 understanding. It's knowing more of who he is, his characteristics. And we talked about Ephesians chapter 2. Well, tonight I want us to look at what does it look like to love God, the Lord our God, with all of our soul. And that word soul in the original Greek is the word psyche, which is where we get psychology from. But it's, it's ultimately this. What that word specifically means is it's the force that keeps us alive. It's almost like a, a deeper, more intimate version of loving the Lord your God with all your heart. The force that keeps us alive, it's, it's, it's what we do. It's what fuels everything that we do, everything that we pursue, everything that we, we try to become is fueled by this, this soul in us. So to love the Lord your God with all of your soul is significant. There's this progression that I think we begin to see as we love the Lord our God with all of our hearts and we're getting to know him more, then our affection for him begins to grow and we choose to continue to, to love him more. And this growth begins to happen as we, as we love God more, as we understand him more, then we begin to trust him more with our lives. We begin to, to follow him more clearly. And this transformation begins to take place. And what ultimately begins to happen is that we begin to take on more of the image and the likeness of Jesus with our lives every single day. So to love the Lord your God with all of your soul begins to to change something. You're saying, I want Jesus at the center, this, this, this person of Jesus at the center of my life. It's, he's, he's the reason I live. He's the reason I do what I do because I'm so focused on him. And as you stay focused on him, it begins to shape who you are. It begins to transform your life to begin to look more like him. So what does loving the Lord your God with all of your soul look like? It looks like becoming more like Jesus. Notice I said becoming it's not be like Jesus, it's becoming like Jesus. Because I think to be like Jesus can almost become discouraging because it's like you want to snap your fingers and all of a sudden you're, you're like Jesus. But 
The reality is, is we'll never be there. We'll never, never be at, on his level. But to become speaks into this progression. It's a growth. It's a transformation that begins to take place over time. And it's tough. It's challenging. There's obstacles involved. There's people involved. And there's things that can cloud the direction that we want. They can tr- cloud our focus. But if you consider who you spend the most time with, the people that you spend your time with. Who you hang out with is who you become. And so if we focus on Jesus being ultimate, and I want to spend the majority of my time knowing him, spending time with him, beginning to to let my life take on more of who he is, then we begin to look more like him. And it does something in us. But I want us to to really understand some very specific, practical things that we can learn from Jesus tonight. So that we can maybe put this into action a little bit more. Because it, it's, it's difficult. It would be so much easier if God said, um, love the Lord your God with all your heart. Love the Lord your God like David loved the Lord your God. Because I can relate to David. I mean, there's moments you go back and read some of the Psalms. And David is like, God, you're my, you're my stronghold. God, you're my fortress. You're my refuge. God, you are, you are everything to me. And then the very next chapter, he's like, God, where are you? Like, I can relate to that. Because there's, there's times I feel like that. Or Nehemiah, if you go back and read the book of Nehemiah, if you've been kind of bored in your Bible reading, go book, read the book of Nehemiah. There's nothing boring about that book. I can, I can relate with Nehemiah. I could be like Nehemiah. There's one part in chapter 13 where he says that I rebuked them and I called down curses from heaven. And then he says, I beat them and pulled their hair out. Like, I, I can relate to that because there's times I feel like that more than, you know, anything else. I'm like, I, I, I can do that. God, why can't I love you like Nehemiah loved you? Or Peter... And Peter was adventurous. He did some crazy things. I can relate to that. But he had a cussing problem. I mean, when Peter kicks his toe, he's, it's, it's not, you know, G-rated for the kids to hear. He had a little bit of anger. But he was also a little bit flaky. Like, I can relate to that. But, but Jesus, that, man, that's a lot. That's overwhelming. So let, let's just kind of break this down into something that maybe we can connect to. So we can maybe live this out this week. So I want to look at a story. If we go back just a few chapters in the book of Mark to Mark chapter 6. And it's the only miracle story that we read in the New Testament that's in all four Gospels. And it's the feeding of the 5,000. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all have an account of this particular miracle story that took place where Jesus shows up on the scene and he performs this incredible miracle. And I think maybe specifically for maybe someone here tonight that you're in a place where you say, I just don't know that I can become like Jesus. Like, there's nothing in my life up to this point that would resemble Jesus at all. Let's not forget who the disciples were. They were a mess. And that's who Jesus was spending the most of his time with. I think this was a monumental moment for the disciples. And so let's pick up and read. Mark chapter 6, starting in verse 33. And a little context here before we read this first verse. This This is a tragic moment for Jesus. He has just found out that John the Baptist, one of his closest friends, somebody that, he was, that was dear to him, has been behead, beheaded by Herod, King Herod. He's taken his head. So this is a tragic moment for Jesus. He is grieving, he is mourning the death of his friend, someone that was very cl- close to him. And so it says that he, that he, was, he was trying to just get away. That's kind of where we find ourselves. Jesus is saying, you know what, I, I just need, to, I need some alone time. I got to get away. I need to grieve the loss of a friend. And so with that is what we pick up in verse 33. It says, the people saw them going, them being Jesus and his disciples. And many recognized them and ran there together on foot from all the cities and got there ahead of them. Because what Jesus was doing, he got on a boat and he was going to go across the sea so he could just get away and spend some time by himself. And it says that they saw him. And they're like, hey, we need to go. We know where he's going. Let's go meet him there. It says, when Jesus went ashore, he saw a large crowd and he felt terrible and needed them to just go away. That's not what my Bible says. Uh, I just made that up to see if you're paying attention. It says, when Jesus went ashore, he saw a large crowd and he felt, let's say this word together on three, one, two, three, compassion. Jesus feels compassion for these people in this moment. This is huge. He feels compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. I, man, if this had been me and I show up on the other side and I've, I'm, I'm in a moment of grief and dealing with loss... Well, uh, let's just be real. I could be dealing with the loss of not being able to eat breakfast that morning, and I'd be frustrated and just need to get away. And I would show up on the other side of the shoreline, and people are showing up, and they're like, hey, we need you right now. I'd be like, hey, guys, listen, today is not the day. 
Like, y'all need to give me some space. You need to give me some time. I don't have time for this right now. That's, that's how I would have responded. You can judge me. That's okay. Um, most of us are probably in that same boat. Jesus does something different. He says he feels compassion for them in a moment that's inconvenient, in a moment that's probably a little bit inconsiderate of Jesus from all the people there. Like, come on, man, like, give him some space. But in that moment, Jesus feels compassion for them, and he begins to teach them. Those two things go together, and we're going to come back to that in just a second. Verse 35 says, and when it was already late, so it's getting late in the day, it's been a long day, the disciples are probably exhausted, Jesus is exhausted, it says his disciples came up to him and said, this place is secluded and it is already late. Send them away so that they may go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. The disciples are hangry. I mean, they've been there all day. They've been watching Jesus. Some of the other accounts say that Jesus wasn't just teaching, but he was actually performing miracles. He was healing the sick. He's teaching them. So it's like the disciples came up to him like, hey, hey, Jesus, listen up. <clears throat> Great sermon. Uh, but it's time to wrap it up. All right, play the music, land the plane. We got to go because we're getting a little hungry. But notice they don't put it on themselves. They put it on everybody else. Like, hey, Jesus, listen, we're just trying to be considerate of everybody else right now. Let's, let's send them away. They need to go eat. This, it's getting late. And notice what Jesus does. But he answered them. You give them something to eat. Now, for these disciples, I'm sure this was a little bit like, wait, what? Jesus, come on. I'm not convinced, and I, I've heard people teach this story. I've taught this story over the years. I'm not convinced that the disciples didn't actually have some food with them in this setting, but just were unwilling to share the food. I don't know that. There's nothing that tells me that specifically, but I just wonder if they actually had something like, hey, Jesus, we need to eat. Like, get these people out of here because we're not giving them some of what we got. Like, they need to go home. Or if they don't, we're going to have to share some of our food. So Jesus says, you give them something to eat. Well, they didn't have anything. At least that's not what's clearly spoken to us. And he says, and they said to him, shall we go and spend 200 denarii on bread and give it to them to eat? So they're asking this question, well, where are we supposed to get this food at for all of them? But he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go look. And when they found out, they said, five and two fish. So they go out and they begin to talk to the people in the crowd. And they come back to Jesus. They say, hey, Jesus, we got five loaves and two fish. Clearly not enough. Let's send these people away so they can go get something to eat. It says, and he ordered them all to recline by groups on the grass. They reclined in groups of hundreds and fifties. And he took the five loaves and the two fish and looking up toward heaven, he blessed the food and broke the loaves, and he gave them to the disciples again and again to set before them, and he divided the two fish among them all. Now, we need to understand that in this culture, the, the author of this, this text in all four books says there's 5,000. But what we know to be true is that they only counted the men in this cultural setting that was normal to only count the men to gauge the size of a crowd. So most likely there was 12, 15, maybe even 20,000 people on the scene that day. That Jesus is going to feed from five loaves of bread and two fish and begin to give it to them. And it says, and they all ate and were satisfied. All 12, 15, 20,000 people all ate and were satisfied. And they picked up 12 full baskets of the broken pieces of bread and of fish. There were 5,000 men who ate the loaves. So the story started off with a bunch of people with no food to eat. And it ends with a bunch of food and no people to finish off the food. Jesus does something miraculous in the story. And it's interesting, and this is a, another sermon for another day, but he says to the disciples, like, give me what you have. Like, just, just bring to me what you got. I know you think that it's not enough. I know that you think that's not adequate. But just bring me what you have and, and, and watch me do my thing. And I think that's a reminder for so many of us because you might be in a place right now where you think to yourself, I have absolutely nothing to bring. I have nothing to offer to God. I am, I am not worthy. I don't have the skill, I don't have the abilities, I've got too much that I've done in my life. I, I, the, nobody else looks at me and thinks that I can do anything well, but I'm telling you tonight that, that what he said to them that day is the same thing that he is telling every single one of us tonight. He's saying, hey, bring me what you got, because I can work with what you got, because what you got is significant, and what you have I can do miracles with. I think it's an important reminder for us to, to have a little bit more confidence in how God wired us and how he shaped us, how he, he molded us to be unique in our specific personal design. But that's not the sermon for today specifically, so let's continue on. Because I think what's happening here is there's something powerful in this story. We see some things about Jesus that I think we can step into and actually live a little bit ourselves. And so let me give you these three things quickly. The first one is compassion, the second one is concern, the third one is generosity. 
And so let me, just, let me just unpack this for us really quickly as we think about what Jesus does in this moment. We read in this, in this, this moment, Jesus is grieving the loss of a friend and he just needs to get away. And it, shows, it says that he has compassion for them. He was compassionate. It's funny, last week I talked about people that are difficult to love. And I shared with you some of my pet peeves, like people that drive in the fast lane, but they're driving really slow. And several of you have told me, Wes, you probably need to slow down. And you're right, I probably do. But it's what's been more funny is so many of you have come up to me this week and you're like, you know what, I can relate. I, people drive me crazy when they do this. Here are some of the things, I wrote them down as I was thinking about this this week. Here's some of the things that some of you told me this week were some of your pet peeves. So these are some of the people that I think you probably have a difficult time loving. I'd say these people qualify as people that maybe are difficult for you to have compassion toward. I'm just taking a guess. I'm making an assumption. I know that's dangerous. Some of you told me something about um, people who text or talk on the phone or take a phone call in the middle of a conversation with you. I mean, anybody raise your hand. You're like, man, that, yeah, that really eats me up. Like, don't take a phone call. I need to take notes of who's raising their hand so I don't ever do that. Because sometimes, okay, all right, all right. That's a, that, those, it's tough to have compassion on people like that. What about people, um, this, I heard this twice this week. Uh, somebody said, you know what drives me crazy is when somebody's walking around and they're talking on speakerphone in the midst of everybody else. Does that drive anybody else crazy? All right, all right, we got a few more hands going up. All right, take notes, some of you who are speakerphone talkers. All right, you're driving people crazy and people don't want to have compassion for you. You're, you're, you're giving people a stumbling block to love you well. Okay, I'm just, just telling you that's not the point of the message today. Here's another one, silverware on their teeth, people that rake the fork against their teeth. Like some of you are cringing right now thinking about that. You're like, oh yeah, that, yeah, that just, that, I can't do that. Um, I can relate to this one. This drives me crazy. Somebody said this this week. They said when you're sitting on a plane and the plane lands and comes to a stop, but you're sitting on an aisle seat and everybody stands up. And everybody knows it's going to take 20 minutes to start deboarding the plane, but everybody's going to stand up and everybody's like hovering over you, just breathing on you. And you're like, man, just, just get away. Like that, that I, I can relate to that. I, I totally can get to that. And then here's another one. I can't relate to this one, but I understand it because I could at one point in time. Maybe you're here and you're single tonight and you get these two questions all the time. And every time you get them, you want to punch somebody in the throat. The first one is, so uh, when are you going to get married? You're like, well, whenever it works out, all right? Thanks for reminding me that I'm not. Or you just got married. And the question is, when are you going to have kids? And it's like, man, don't stop asking me that question. I don't like you right now. I don't love you right now. Um, who are the people that you have a difficult time having compassion for? Let me get a little more real in this moment and press into some areas that maybe we really do have a difficult time feeling compassionate towards certain types of people. Maybe it's the poor or maybe it's the rich People that aren't like you. I'll just be, man, I had this moment yesterday. I was so, I, I, I really, I'm really frustrated with myself. Because God has this funny way when I'm going to teach something. It's almost like he puts me in this test. And he says, okay, you want to teach this? Let's see how well you do with this. And so yesterday, we're in Austin. And we pull up at an intersection. And there's someone on the corner who is asking for money. And they've got their sign. They've got their shopping cart. They've got their, their dog. Um, and I, I just... I, I can become numb to that sometimes, and that's not really not a good thing, because I, I sit there and I'm, I'm like trying to think through it, and I'm being critical, and I think I know their situation, so because of the things that I would assume about their situation, I don't need to give them anything, and so I just expect everybody around me to think the same way that I do, and that's not okay, all right, I'm just telling you, like, I probably need to, to work, let God work in that a little bit, but here's where it kind of wrecked me a little bit. The light's about to turn green, we're sitting there, and Cam goes, hey, can I have a dollar, mom? I was like, no, we're not giving any money out today, Cam. And the light turns green, and we drive off. And I'm like, Wes, you're an idiot. <laughs> like, are you serious? Like, you're going to talk about this tomorrow. And you had the perfect opportunity to share a great story that everybody would assume a pastor would share, and you do the opposite. But I think there's something there. And that's why I share that story because I think there's probably something there for every single one of us. There's, there are people in our lives that either annoy us or irritate us or they don't think like us, that they've offended us, or they, they don't talk like us, don't look like us, and, and it becomes difficult to feel compassionate for them. It's difficult because maybe it's inconvenient. We don't have the time. Listen, Jesus had every reason to say, hey, guys, listen, I'm grateful that you're here. But today is just not the day, and I, I just need you to give me some space. And, hey, why don't you come back tomorrow? And tomorrow I'll, I'll be compassionate. But it says he was compassionate in that very 
moment. And the reason that I say that to us today is because I wonder what would it look like if we began to look at people through the lens of compassion rather than through the lens of criticism. Because there's something that happens here and, and compassion is what began to stir this in this moment. I can be really, really critical of people. I can be really critical of things. And there's some value to that in, in certain ways in my life, but there's some, there's some danger in that. I think that we can all kind of fall into that at some time, but I wonder what it would look like if we just specifically ask God, God, w- would you help me to see people like you see people? God, would you help me to see my kids like you see my kids when they just won't be quiet and I just want to lock them in a soundproof closet? That maybe, maybe you've never felt that way. I, I haven't either, I promise. God, would you help me see people the way that you see people? Would you help me see my boss like you see my boss? Would you help me see my employees like you see my employees? Would you help me see my mother-in-law like you see my mother-in-law? I, I, I say that kind of jokingly, not specifically just about the mother-in-law. But seriously, what would it look like to pray that prayer and say, God, would you help me to see specifically the people around me that I have a more difficult time loving and showing compassion for, would you help me to see them and respond to them like you would? I promise you, you begin to start praying that prayer, he's going to answer that prayer, and then you're going to have a choice to make. And you're going to be like, God, I was just kidding. (laughs) I really didn't want to see that now that I see it. But I think it could begin to completely shake up some of the ways that we interact with the people we care about the most. I'll never forget this encounter I had with a student several years ago. I didn't even live in Cyprus yet. I still lived in Dallas. I was a student pastor, and we were at a camp at a place called Mount Lebanon. And I didn't know this student before the week. I was speaking for one of the uh, larger groups of students. We had it broken down by grade, and so there's probably two or 300, I think there were 10th graders that I was speaking to throughout the week in the morning sessions. And um, this guy comes up to me at the end of the, one of the sessions. We're sitting out there waiting for lunch. He goes, hey, man, can I talk to you? And I said, yeah, sure, what's up? And he goes, Man, I'm really struggling at home. And there were some things that I I must have talked about in my message that kind of spurred some of these thoughts. And he said, man, I'm really struggling in my relationship with my mom. I was like, well, tell me about that. Like, help me me understand what you're talking about. He said, man, it's it's just me and my mom. He said, I've never really met my dad. And uh, he said, it's it's just a really difficult relationship. She's, She's... really, really, really strict, and, and, but she's also really, really overprotective, and she expects that I do the absolute best in everything that I do, and he says, it's just created some conflict in this relationship, and um, the guy, the, the student, I, I, was, I was really impressed with just how aware he was of the situation, and how well he was able to just communicate, and so I just began to ask him some questions. I said, hey, man, so, so yeah, that sounds a little bit challenging. I said, tell me, tell me a, little bit about, a little bit about your mom, and he said, well, I think I specifically asked him some questions. I said, um, tell, me, tell me about her. And he, he went on to basically say, you know, she had been married twice and had been divorced twice. And both of them were results of an affair because the, the man in the relationship had chosen to have an affair. And then she, he said, he talked about her parents. And he said that her parents were both in the military. So she traveled around a lot with the military family and that her parents were incredibly strict and regimented and expected her to, to do everything the right way, to always look the right way. And uh, just kind of began to unpack some things. And I, it, was, it, was, it was cool because as we were having this conversation, he started to, it was almost like the light bulb began to come on before I even had to say anything. So I just kind of began to ask him some more questions. And I said, man, have you ever really considered what it's like to walk in your mom's shoes? And he said, no, I really haven't. And, and this kid clearly cared about his mom. He was genuinely asking the question because he wanted things to be better. And it's like the light bulb came on for him. He said, you know what, I, maybe, I, I think I know why she's so hard on me to do really well in all the things that I pursue. Because that's the only thing she knows. She was raised that way. And so that's the way that she thinks is best to raise me. And then he said, I, I realize why she's so overprotective of me, why she doesn't let me stay out late at night, why she doesn't let me go to certain places with my friends, because she is terrified that the last person in her life, because her parents had passed away, the last person in her life that, that she had a healthy relationship with would all of a sudden be gone too. And it was like he had this moment where he, he recognized. Now, I don't know that that just made the relationship great when he got home. I never had any follow-up conversation with the, with the guy. But I think that there was something there where it opened his eyes to see his mom in a way that maybe God saw his mom. 
And I wonder if that began to shape some of the conversations, some of the interactions, some of the, some of the patience, some of the understanding of what was going on in that dynamic, and if it helped that relationship. And I wonder if we can do some of the same thing, if we just take a step back and say, God, I need to see them like you see them. And then he begins to work in that to show us more about them and what it's like, but we, we, we oftentimes can't take the focus off ourselves, and we need them to consider us. We need them to have compassion for us first. I think this will begin to shape and completely change the relationships around us. I would say that there's some here tonight that maybe we need to stop praying for our spouse or for our marriage, and we need to start asking God to help us see our spouse differently. And that we would respond differently. We would respond with compassion, even when it's inconvenient. Or even when it maybe feels a little bit insensitive for them to need something from you because you've had a really difficult day. But I wonder if God could do something that would begin to shape a miracle in the relationships that we find ourselves in. You see this happen in this context. And compassion was the foundation for the miracle that took place that day. But it wasn't just compassion. It was also concern. You know, we all have things that we're concerned about. And some of them are a little bit ridiculous. You can be driving down the road, like this happened to me a couple weeks ago, my check engine light comes on. And all of a sudden, when that light comes on, like you're, you're laser focused on it, like, oh no, what's going to happen? Is my car about to blow up? Is a wheel about to fall off? Like what's, I, and I'm not mechanically um, advanced at all. And so I see that thing come on, I'm like, oh, it's, it's over. <laughs> like it's over. I just, I, I need a new vehicle. Brandy, we got to buy a new vehicle. It's, it, my, my truck's dead. And, uh, and then the light just goes off. And I'm like, okay, cool. So I'm not concerned about that anymore. Concerned about our kids. Concerned about being late. I was joking with my wife this week. We were about to go to Austin. Some friends of ours were going, leaving at the same time, and we were running late because I have a tendency to maybe run late sometimes. And Brandy is like stressed out. She's like, come on, we got to go. We got to go. She is concerned that we're going to miss our window of leaving at the same time as our friends. But here's what's funny to me. She gets in her car, and she's like, oh, I got to get gas. I was like, well, me too. The difference was is I had like 60 miles till empty. She was literally on zero miles to empty. And I was like, oh, man, we're going to have to stop. I was planning on stopping at Bucky's because there's never a good road trip if you don't include Bucky's in your road trip. Get some cherry sour, some beaver nuggets, some beef jerky. Drop a 200 bucks on three people real fast. <laughs> and she goes, oh, I can make it to Bucky's. Like, we live in Fairfield. Bucky's is, I don't know how far Waller is from my house, probably 10 miles, I just guess. I'm like, wait, you're on zero miles. She's like, it'll be fine. <laughs> I'm like, you've got all this anxiety about being late, but you're okay driving on zero for 10 miles? Like, we need to figure some things out. And we just laughed about that. But we, we can be cons- when we're concerned about things, we can become obsessed with them. And there's some things that are a little bit more serious than that. Maybe it's the upcoming doctor's appointment because you've noticed something about you and you're like, man, I, I probably need to get somebody to check this out. And it becomes a, a concern or a concern about a relationship, concern about our finances, concern about our job performance that can completely consume our minds. The reason I say all that because I think you see something with what's going on with Jesus on this day, in this moment. He has compassion for these people, but it says that he also begins to teach them things. There's a reason. There's something else. And I think there's a danger for us as church people sometimes that we can put these in the wrong order. We can become really concerned about people before we ever feel compassion for people. Because we can become people who say, hey, you need to stop it. Stop it, stop it, stop it. Knock it off. Like, you need to stop taking that, you need to stop drinking that, you need to stop smoking that, you need to stop popping that. Like, you need to, you need to get your life right, you need, to, you need to drop him like a bad habit. Like, you need, you need to do all, you, you need to stop, stop, stop. And we're so concerned with trying to make people fit in a specific box or to look a specific way or talk a specific way or, or act more like us in a way that makes us feel more comfortable. But there's a danger in that because when we do that, we're leaving no room for compassion. Jesus starts with compassion, but then you see this concern take place. And as long as we are allowing compassion to be the foundation for the miracle that's going to happen in a relationship, in a a job environment, we let the, the compassion be the foundation. We allow compassion to be the motivation. And what begins to happen is our concern falls in the right order. And we become concerned about the right things. Because we can become so focused on the exterior, we can become so focused on the performance that we miss what Jesus was concerned about that day. Because Jesus wasn't just teaching them how to make bread or how to catch fish or how to do specific things. He was teaching them more about who he is and who he is to them. Because more than 
taking care of their physical need on that day. Jesus was more concerned with their eternal security, their eternal destination. He wanted them to understand who he is and who he was going to be to them and what he was about to do. So he's teaching them in this day. He's meeting their physical need. And then he begins to teach them about their spiritual need for something that's more than themselves. You see, last week, you guys let me off the hook because I got up here and I taught the message last week and I didn't use any notes, which I don't know why I did that, but it just felt like the right thing to do. But we're in a series called Love Revolution. I didn't even tell you what Love Revolution means. Why are we talking about Love Revolution? And you're all like, oh, that's cool. That's real good. And maybe you didn't say that because you're nice and you're like, you know what, that didn't make sense, but good job, Wes. But here's the reason I chose that title. I don't know if you ever looked up the, rev the, the definition of revolution. But a revolution is an overthrow of a government or a specific society for something new. So the reason I chose love revolution is because we're to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength, all our mind. And what we're doing is we're overthrowing a system of thinking, a system of building our own kingdoms for something new. But not just something new, for something better. Because what I found in Jesus, I love more than what I have, what I've done, what I've become, what I've accomplished. What I found in Jesus, I, I love even more than the things I love about me. The things that I love in life. And because I have found this, I have overthrown the, the societal structure in my own life to live for myself and I want to live for him. But not only do I want to live for him, but when I begin to live in this way, and this love revolution begins to take over my life, then what I found, I want people to find. I want other people to meet the same Jesus. I want other people to experience the same love that I have found in Jesus, that you have found in Jesus. And something begins to take place in our lives. That's the revolution that we're talking about. There's this overthrow of, of how we've always thought, what we've always been, how we've always interacted with the people around us. That's the reason for the series is that we would grow closer, that we would live out this love revolution. As we begin to know God and as we begin to love him more, as we begin to trust him more, we begin to see transformation take place in our lives and begin to take on more of his image and his likeness. And when we do that, we become more like him, not just in appearance, but in the way that we live every single day. And you see this in Jesus, and I think these are, these are things that we can begin to put into practice in our own lives, to begin to see people like he sees them and have compassion towards them, to become concerned about the things that he's concerned about. This is why we care for one another at Church Story. This is why we care for our city. We're in the early days of this new church. And I think the dream, the, 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 the idea that we've had from day one is that, that this would be a place where we care for one another, like we genuinely care for one another. Not Wes cares for everybody, not that Wes and a, a few of us care for the community, but that we collectively care for the community around us. So much so that if church story was to just disappear one day, the community around us would weep because it means so much to them who we are and what we do to, to love them well, to have compassion for them. We're not sitting in our gatherings together in a space like this, pointing our finger at the world saying, man, you need to get it together. When you get it together, you can come join us. But that we would care. This is why. Because you see Jesus do this. Not only is there compassion or concern, but you see this generosity. And it's not the generosity of the disciples, it's the generosity of a young boy. That's what you read in one of the other gospels. This boy brings his loaves and these two fish. And you see this incredible display of generosity where Jesus takes what the boy gives and he says, watch this. And here's where I find a lot of confidence what that means for us is that everything we need to do everything God wants to do, he's already made available to us. He's just calling us to be generous with what we have. To live open-handed as we're living compassionate towards the people around us, concerned about their eternal destination. That we would live open-handed and being willing to give up the things that we love because we found something that we love more. This revolution has taken place in our lives. Several years ago, there was a man named Mr. Pewitt, Nelson Pewitt. Um, he was a running back for the University of Texas in the 1930s. Um, he became a really successful man in Austin in the real estate world in the 50s. Um, he bought a ranch out in far west Texas. And I told the story last week about a ranch in west Texas that my dad worked on. And um, we knew Mr. Pewitt really well. And Mr. Pewitt was one of the most generous people I'd ever been around. 
But there was a, a moment in my life where his generosity impacted my life deeply. And uh, I had graduated from high school, I'd gone off to college, and I was working while I was going to school, trying not to take on a bunch of debt. And um, after walking through a difficult season in our family, where our family uh, ended up going in different directions than I ever intended it or ever thought it would go, and my parents splitting up, and just, just walking through that confusion, Nelson Pewitt wrote my dad a letter, and my dad's, and then he sent me a copy of it, and it just simply said, Dear Bruce, my dad's, my dad's name, it says, Dear Bruce, uh, I've been worried about your boys. I've been worried about what's going on, and uh, I don't know what to do, uh, but I thought about this, and I thought maybe I could do something. You see, there's, there's compassion, and there was some concern, and because of that, it led him to do something, and he was incredibly generous, because then he went on to say, he said, hey, listen, I want to I wanna help pay for your boys' college um, so that they can go to school and, you know, not take on a bunch of debt. And so he gave us money so that I could continue to go through school and finish school. And um, it was an incredibly generous act that was fueled by compassion because he, he was concerned for us. And I'm super thankful for that. It, it, it shaped some things in my life. It changed my life. And I'm, I'm grateful. And I think that's what God is calling us to step into. To love the Lord your God with all of your soul means to begin to take on his likeness, which means to live like him. We become more like him and we begin to live lives of generosity. One man's generosity changed me. It blows people's minds because it's not normal to be generous most of the time. Most of us struggle with being generous. I worked at Cracker Barrel when I was in college for about four months and then I realized I hated it. Uh, but while I worked there, you know what I hated the most is working on Sundays because there was always the church crowd that would come in on Sunday afternoons. They always came in big parties. They never came just as one family. It was like 15 families and their demon-possessed children. They would all show up at the same time. <laughs> and they would sit down and they would take forever to order and then they would complain about their food when it arrived. It was never good enough. And, and then they would leave and they would leave like a dollar and a, a gospel track. I'll never forget that one time. One time I waited on this table and there was like six people in this, in this group and they had just come from church. They were dressed up all nice and neat, had their suits and their dresses and everything. They looked great. And they were, they were friendly. There wasn't a bad experience until they left a tip. And the tip was like 68 cents because that's what change was left over to the dollar, the last dollar that they had spent for their meal. And they just left it on the table. And right next to the table was a gospel of Jesus tract. Like, here's how you can meet Jesus. And I'm like, I already met Jesus, you fool. You are a certified rear end. Like, get out of here. I was so frustrated. I was like, man, church people. Like, what is wrong with us? Because I am one. And you know what? That was, that was consistent. That was, that was, that was, and, and, and we would talk about it. The other servers, we, we would talk about, oh man, it's Sunday. All those cheap Christians are going to come in. <laughs> we always, if, if you're one of those people, you just need to know this. If you're one of those people and you don't leave a tip or you leave like 68 cents, you're being talked about <laughs> and not in ways you want to be talked about. Like, what, what, would we, what would it look like if we began to be people of generosity without expecting anything in return? We begin to just live a little more open-handed. We go out to eat this week. We look at them and say, how, how, what's, what's the biggest tip you've ever gotten? And they say, uh, you know, I don't know, 10 bucks. All right, you know what, tonight I'm going to triple that. Here you go. And not only tip well, but, like, get to know them. Ask them their name. Ask them where they're from. Ask them why they're in Cyprus. You know what I found out in a lot of the restaurants around here? A lot of the people that are waiting on, on you in these restaurants are college students from other places. They don't have family. They don't have connection. They're looking for it. They're looking for somebody that cares about them. What would, be, what would it look like if we began to be people of compassion and concern and generosity? Not just with our money, but with our time. Pushing pause on the conversation that we're invested in the moment, saying, hey, you know what? I want to give you a little bit of my time, and I, I want to know a little bit about you. I think that's what Jesus is, is displaying for us. This is what he's calling us into. I think this is what it looks like to become more like Jesus. Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan's the goat. You're like, no, Wes, I'm not sure he is. Listen, that's just my opinion, and you have every right to be wrong. <laughs> Michael Jordan, in my opinion, is the goat. Kobe was good. LeBron is good. Steph Curry is good. Luca is good. But Michael Jordan was special. But then after Michael Jordan stopped playing basketball... He began to do other things, like become an actor. And Michael Jordan was not good at being an actor. Space Jam, 
Great movie, terrible acting job. Haynes commercials, they were okay, but he's pretty terrible at being an actor in a Haynes commercial. Not only did he become an actor, he tried to play baseball for a little while, and he thought he was good. He was terrible. <laughs> he just wasn't a great baseball player. He became an owner of a basketball franchise, and that franchise has never really been very successful. Why do I tell you that? Because you put a basketball in Michael Jordan's hands, and he's extraordinary because he's doing what he was gifted to do. But as soon as you disconnect Michael Jordan from the basketball, he's mediocre at best. He's average. And I know that God has designed each one of us in a unique way, but he's uniquely designed us to be together, to share compassion, to be concerned about the world around us, to be open-handed, to see people like he sees people, to be concerned about the things that he's concerned about and to use everything that we have to see people know and, know and understand more of who he is so they begin to love him with all their heart, their soul, their mind, their strength. But the moment that you disconnect yourself from that, you'll only live a life of mediocrity and you will always miss the purpose, the plan, the reason for living. God's designed you for something. He's designed us for something. What would it look like if we became a people obsessed with compassion, deeply concerned, living open-handed? 12, 15, 20,000 people that day experienced a miracle. There's a lot more than that within five miles of the place we're sitting tonight. There's also a lot of churches within five miles of the place that we're sitting tonight. But I'm a little concerned that maybe there's a lot of church people sitting in churches, but not enough changed people sitting in churches. How do we change? We look at Jesus, we trust Jesus, we get to know Jesus, let our lives become more like his uses us to do extraordinary things in us and around us. And there's, there's nothing, once you start to live for that and you begin to experience that, there's nothing better than that. And that's the call for us tonight, is that we would step into that. But you can't become like Jesus if you don't know Jesus. You know, if you look through the New Testament, specifically the four Gospels, you see account after account after account of Jesus being compassionate, being concerned about the eternal security of the people that he's interacting with. You see generosity on display, but maybe the ultimate example is when Jesus goes to the cross. Because it was on the cross that you see the greatest display of compassion. Jesus goes after that because if he didn't, the ending is tragic for us. There's no hope. It was compassion that led him to the cross. It was the cross that displays the concern that he has for us because it was the cross that defeated death. It was the cross that says that death doesn't have the final say in my life. It was the cross that was probably the most gener generous thing we've ever seen in the history of humanity. How do you know the value of something? By the price that somebody's willing to pay and Jesus paid his life so that death had no power over you and, and me. And I know many of you have you've, you've, you've recognized that and you've stepped into that, but I wonder if tonight there's maybe some here, or maybe just one, that you don't know that Jesus, you've never gotten to know that Jesus. And I would just ask you, is tonight the night that you begin to get to know Jesus and you step into that relationship? I just want to encourage you, if that's you tonight, I'll, I'll be around as long as I need to be tonight to have any conversation and answer questions, and I don't have all the answers. But all it is is simple recognition of who he is and saying, Jesus, I trust you. Thank you for doing what you did on my behalf, in my place. It was my sin, but you took on the penalty. Thank you for that. I want to trust you and live my life for you. And if that's you tonight, just in the next moment as we sing this song, just, just tell him that. Respond in that way keep looking to him, you keep chasing after him, you keep pursuing him, 
and you'll become, you'll become more like him sooner than